So welcome to the Firecatchers classroom. We are, the topic is Elevate Your Praise. I'm Andrea York, the creator of Catch the Fire Worship Flags, but this is a Fire Catchers event where we try to do this monthly, some monthly training. Today we're doing something a little different. I'm actually trying to record, to live stream it in our Facebook group. So we'll see if that actually gets going. Um, but for everyone here is in the Zoom meeting, this is great. Welcome here. I see like quite a number of new faces, which is awesome. Uh, and um, if you have any questions or comments, you can uh, pop them into the chat. And I'll try to, uh, if it's appropriate, I will uh, incorporate your comment or your question into the presentation. Uh, if not, then we'll kind of have some, have some time at the end. Carrie Anna, if so if we get going on Facebook, we will, um, okay, hang on, 9.12, I need to make a note of the time because when later, may not work, so it doesn't matter if it doesn't, I guess then it was never meant to be. Um, so let's pray before we begin. And then afterward, actually, there's gonna be an opportunity and a time, I'm gonna talk a little bit about elevating your praise in Bhutan. Um, but at that point, there'll be the teaching will actually be done. All right, so you could you could go at that time, and if you have to go at any time, that's okay. You don't have to stay here. <laughs> so, uh, Lord, I just want to thank you for for fire catchers all around the world, for the fire catchers that are joining us today, for your presence in our lives, for how we've responded to you, how you've wooed us, how you've invited us into worship, uh, that we would actually elevate our praise to you, uh, that we would lift our hands, elevate our praise, and that you would take us higher and higher every time we do that, and that there would be influence. And Father, I pray that this teaching is, will be impactful, that it'll, that it'll, uh, Kind of hit the hit the target, hit the mark, and I feel like this is a message that you've uh, that you've given to me. It's definitely a life message that I have that I'm able to share. And so, Father, whatever is not of the Holy Spirit, I just ask that you'd cast that away. That it would not be remembered, and um, just that the truth remains in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. So when I was in grade eleven. 11th grade, as you say, in the United States, uh, we had an assignment for history class. So if you've heard the story, Jen, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, un hang on one second. It's just telling me one thing. Um, we'll try. Pardon me. Ariana, I'm also going to make you the host, uh, co-host, so that you can also keep, keep tracking that, okay? Sorry about that interaction. All right, so if you've heard this story, which I think, Jen, you have, the assignment uh, we had in 11th grade was to, to create a family tree for as far back as you could research. Most of the students, if not all the students, were second or third generation Canadians. So I grew up in the prairies in the Mennonite settlements so in Manitoba, just above South North Dakota. Uh, the largest settlement it was among a lot of the smaller towns, um, and every student ended up there by one of two ways, either by the Ukraine, which is how my family had ended up in Steinbach, or by way of South America, and predominantly, uh, specifically Paraguay or Mexico. They came up from, from the South, came in that way. The second part of the assignment was to create a narrative of the trip your family had to arrive and settle in that area. Now, if you didn't have a living relative who knew your specific family story, the students had the option to read a few biographies of similar stories and then personalize the events for their own family. See, we all had similar storylines. And as worship sp worshipers, but specifically flagging worshipers, most of us have similar stories. God wooed your heart just like he did mine. So back then, I thought it was my decision. It was that it was my idea. I, he gave me a taste, just a taste, way back in high school. Uh, this past summer, when I went back to Manitoba, uh, I met a, an old friend. We had, we had some coffee. Uh, we shared, he's back there as well. 
And so we shared an afternoon of reminiscing about our teen years. Lots of it made us laugh and feel like the same joy, the memories back when we made them. But a lot of those memories, I don't know about you, uh, in when I think about high school, uh, a lot of them made me cringe because I thought I was so cool, but I really kept my guardian angels working overtime to keep me safe for myself. Most of the, my, my peers would never have guessed that I'd grow up to become like the church lady. My choices were really reckless and faith didn't matter all that much to me. It's actually become like kind of an ironic joke among old high school friends that of everyone, I'm one of the most passionate about pursuing Jesus with my whole life. I think a lot of the, my classmates have either turned aside or it's just not that important. But my friend who I met with in the summer, he wasn't surprised, which actually surprised me. He had seen how my heart had been captured by God. He said his most vivid memory of me was at a youth worship event that we attended in the city. So we just lived just outside of the city and we'd go into the city for, for dates or whatever. Uh, and, but so this worship event was at a big church. It was huge and we were quite late. So the only available seats were right at the back. So I remember having the black, the glass right behind me, but it didn't matter because something broke loose for me and I worshiped with my whole heart. It was, it was the first experience that I had to worship that way. He said that he looked over at me and he looked at the, the look on my face, told him that I wasn't present in the room. I was somewhere else. I never knew this, but I do remember that night because it gave me a taste of what worship could me could be. It, um, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand that it wasn't an event. I didn't understand that worship wasn't an event. I didn't have the language to say that what I had experienced, that it was true, intimate worship. I didn't, under, I didn't have the language to understand that it was the, an intimate experience of God, but that's exactly what it was. We live close to train, so pardon the train. Um, but that night, sadly, I'd say, I would love to say that it changed everything. It didn't, I, I didn't change, not then. Um, but I, I remembered that moment. It was a, it was a one-off for me, but for many years, like I, I wondered if I had amplified it, if I had over exaggerated it. Nope. Okay. Yes. That's it. You know, when you have something so incredible, one wonderful, and the enemy comes to try to steal it, uh, it makes you doubt that the experience was real. But having my friend uh, share that memory, share his memory with me from his perspective, it really validated and confirmed, even all these years later. Um, so that what the adversary had tried to steal for two decades, uh, actually confirmed. And it was, it was, I loved it. I really enjoy it. I, I like the confirmation, even after all this time, knowing what I know now and how I, I understand God's presence. It was still, was it really as great as it was? And he confirmed that. So I was really grateful, but I didn't have a comparable moment like that for another 18 years at that time. So so 18 years later, I was in, this was now a few, this is about a decade ago, I was in transition, changing from an evangelical environment, uh, moving towards a more openly charismatic uh, church. It was new and wonderful, and quite frankly, uh, it was a little terrifying. Uh, yeah, it still drew me again and again. Once again, I didn't have language. I didn't know how to describe what my spirit recognized but my head just could not reconcile. I was a sideline attendee, a lurker. How many of you have been lurkers? Before, before God totally drew, 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 uh, drew, drew you in. I can't even speak. So I was a lurker. I'd go to the meetings, but I, I wouldn't really participate. Uh, there, were pla there were places where worship lights were being used. It was the first time I had seen that. Um, and although... I, I wanted to, I had not lost, lost the inhibition that I ha needed to, to use them. I, but I wanted more 
and more of God. It was really insatiable, but I couldn't let go. I couldn't surrender and worship. Not yet. Instead, I threw myself into studying the Bible, ingesting his words, being changed by his words. I was, I was loving God, listening to God and just teetering on the edge of total submission and surrender. Like pardon the metaphor, but it was all foreplay years and months of building up desire. So one night I was at the church and the Holy Spirit asked, are you ready to go all the way? I didn't hesitate. I kicked off my shoes, picked up a pair of flags for the first time ever. And I let go of every pretense that kept me back from intimacy with him. I touched the heart of God. It was so pure, so beautiful. The next day I crashed. I took my walk of shame. Now, if you've never had a walk of shame the morning after, bless you. You are lucky. The night before, I was clothed in righteousness. My face transformed. But that morning, my clothes were out of place, and the glow on my face was smeared like day-old makeup. I had so much shame. Who did I think I was to feel so much to know him so intimately when I had was nothing but a dirty little girl who deserved none of his attention. It really must have been a lapse in judgment on his part because I had seen him for who he was and the next morning I saw myself for who I was. We were not compatible and I was embarrassed by how sure I had been that I could dive into his arms the way that I had. Like, who was I? but he didn't discard me. You probably have a story like this. He earnestly and openly started dating me, like in public. He courted me and he wooed me and he won my heart because he exposed his. After that moment, I was in full on pursuit of God through the scripture from, uh, I had been, full-on pursuit of the scripture of God. But after that moment, it was as if I discovered more about God through worship than I had ever learned through reading his words. So what is worship? There's lots of definitions. This is, this is personally my own definition. Worship, like true worship, is accurately seeing God as he is and responding to him. Revelations 4 8 says, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. In Ezekiel 10 12, that says their whole body with their the, with the back, their hands, their wings, and the wheels that, that the four had were full of eyes all around. So the four creatures in heaven, each one with the face of a cherub, a man, a lion, and an eagle, were closest in proximity to the throne. Revelation 4 um, describes, describes the, the scene. And they had eyes all around, inside, outside, everywhere. Meaning that the one who is on the throne is always within their sight. So it's, it's telling that when you see God, when he's always in your sight, you never stop worshiping. What does God want? He's looking for worshipers. God is looking for worshipers. John 24, 23 says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such to worship him. When I was a selfish lover, I resented the mandate to worship. I really did. I saw it as a directive, a command, and I rebelled and I wanted to satisfy my own desires. But I had it wrong. Very, very, very wrong. Worship frees me. It frees you. If it's true, and, and it is, that in him and only him that we are alive, that every breath is sustained by him, by God, then when we worship, when we accurately see God as he is, then we are also the most fully ourselves. Intimacy, and that's what we're after, is mutually beneficial. 
You cannot have one partner make demands on the other that doesn't benefit the other as well. Worship is an invitation. God does not demand worship. It took me years to discover this, to understand his heart about worship. He invites us to worship because it's the greatest invitation to know him. It's proof of the greatest triumph of our bondage. Exodus 3, 12 says, God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign to you that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. The Israelites were in bondage for, in Egypt for 400 years. In their mind, God wasn't powerful. He wasn't with them, and they certainly didn't know him. They were far more familiar with the Egyptian gods and deities. They were oppressed as slaves, and they wanted freedom from oppression. That was as complex as their desire was. They didn't want to know God. They just didn't want to be slaves. What they learned from the Egyptians was that gods were meant to be appeased, that they were distant, that you had to, that you had to try to work towards this relationship that somehow they might bless you. So when God invited Moses on an adventure, and we know the story of Moses that he'd grown up in the Hebrew or in the Egyptian mindset and the worldview, he was taught that, and then he was exiled. I'm not going to get into that, but you understand, you understand this skepticism that Moses had uh, when God invited him. The slaves had no grid for luxury, right? Moses had a little bit of a different grid, but he, but the the slaves they didn't have a grid for the luxuries. They didn't have anything such as hope or a relationship with a distant deity. Also, why would you want one? Because they were scary. And they certainly had no understanding of true worship. As far as they understood, worship was subservience. It was just more subservience. It was more demands on you. And even Moses didn't know what to make of God. Who was God? And where had he been all this time? So God gave Moses a promise. The promise of his presence. He said, I will be with you. He gave the promise of relationship. I am the one. And he gave the promise of victory. When you have brought the people out of worship, out of Egypt, when, not if, when, that's the promise of victory. It seems like an offer that no one would refuse, right? But they had made a big mistake. In Exodus 19, it says, in the third month, the children of Israel had gone out in the third month, sorry, after the children had gone out of Israel, out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. So Israel camped there before the mountain. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's winds and brought you to myself. He did it. God had done it. He fulfilled his promise. But the people were still in bondage and closed their hearts. And they answered, then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear you, but not, let not God speak with us lest we die. That's not Exodus 20, 19. They were content to have a mediator, to stay distant from God, the only one who could truly free them. They were out of Egypt, but they were still not free. To be free, they had to go up the mountain to worship God there. So mountains are metaphors. We understand um, scripture speaks about literal mountains, and there's there's several references to significant significant experiences on mountaintops. Uh, but we also understand the metaphor of mountains. Like so, literally, they are uh, is generally I generally accepted as thin places where heaven and earth are near. The axis is difficult, making obedient devotion an act of worship. David said, I will not offer the Lord something that did not cost me anything. So going up a mountain, it's strenuous. And so there is, there is a, a cost to you to go up. It's set apart. It's distant from the demands of life, free from distraction. And on the mountaintops, literally, there were shrines and altars and temples were built on mountains and high places. Like It's like staking a claim on the mountaintop. As the metaphor, their mountains are symbols of opposition, 
and victory. We have mountaintop experiences. We have mountains that are obstacles in our way. Um, they are elevated experiences. So when we have like a mountaintop experience, it's an elevated experience with God. It's also an isolated experience. You're not going to find a lot of people at the top. Passion is offensive to people who don't understand it. So just put a, a mental bookmark here and we'll come back to this a little bit later. The benefits of going when God invites you to go. So when God invites you to go, number one benefit is intimacy. When God extends an invitation, to join him. It's because he's already there. He's not sending you ahead. He's, he's waiting there for you. When God called Moses, he barely knew him. It's no surprise that Moses said no at first, right? Didn't your mom tell, tell you not to go with strangers? <laughs> that um, it takes relationship. It's the equivalent of asking, uh, offering a polite excuse to that awkward guy that asks you on a date. No thanks, I'm already booked for the rest of my life. No one wants to hang out days on end for someone they don't know. But truly, is there a better way to get to know someone? You, you really need to literally spend time with them. So thankfully, he keeps asking. And he keeps breaking down the barriers that keeps you separate until finally you have no more excuses. You agree to a date. Just one. But one date leads to another date, which leads to another date. And you build trust and mutual admiration and response. Then suddenly, over time, you relate to Moses when he said, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from the here. And then he had the audacity to say, please show me your glory. Moses had a remarkably intimate relationship with God, all because he went when God invited him. There are times when you will have to leave the mundane behind and move to a different plane to be where God wants you to be with him. But be confident in this one thing. When God extends an invitation to join, it's because he's already there. He is always the instigator for intimacy. A second benefit of going when God asks you to go is supernatural ability. So let's consider Moses's. uh literal journey up the mountain. He was on his second 40 day fast back to back. And if you've ever done a 40 day fast without eating or drinking anything, you no, know, he did dry fast. Moses did dry fasts. Let me assure you that it is not physically possible to climb a mountain twice. Some days I've done a 40 day fast. Some days my husband find me just sitting and staring at a wall for long periods at a time. The brain function kind of Everything is about um, focused on one thing. And if you don't need to talk or think, then you don't. But when I worship, even when I'm fasting, when I worship, especially worshiping with flags, that is some, the way that I connect with God. Something otherworldly happens and I come alive. The same miracle happened when I was in Tibet a couple of years ago. We are at Yamdrak Lake which is one of their significant religious sites. Um, it's 16,000 feet above elevation. Walking distance, a distance of like 50 yards seemed literally like, it was like a, a marathon. It's like you've never experienced such fatigue and how the distance seems so, so far away. And yet I was able to worship and dance for 25 minutes. Like that is, out of that whole trip, I think that was the biggest miracle. Worship, true worship, really allows you to see who God is. And it's when you are also able to most fully be yourself as God intended. He intends for you to have these supernatural experiences. He intends for you to live a supernatural, super ability in your life. That's what worship does. Worshiping the metaphorical mountain in your life provides proof for what is possible when God invites you. Victory and achievement most certainly is outside your personal ability. It really is. I mean, we just can't live the Christian life without it, without God. But what becomes possible is the impossible when you worship. Victory and achievement um, will require an ability from outside another source. 
Psalm 121, you probably know this one, 121 verse 1, it says, I will lift my eyes to the hills where my help comes from. A third benefit is a transformation. So first, personal. If you accept the invitation to go up the mountain, don't be surprised when you become transformed and you start to shine from the inside out. When I had that moment, even before my walk of shame, when I had that moment, I, I was transformed. My face was transformed. A solar panel absorbs the energy of the light so that it will become the light in the dark. Another train. Exodus 34, 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with God. But not everybody was happy. Not everybody will be happy when you do it, but do it anyway. So when Moses, sorry, when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of the, his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. In John 15, 18, it says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Do it anyway. It also transforms culture. So worship personally transforms the believer, but when you worship, you transform the culture too. You make it possible for God to move. He precedes every move. So when you go, everyone gets the spoils. Everyone gets the benefit. Does, Isaiah talks about, does he not, does the rain not come down on the righteous and the unrighteous? When you, when you ask for rain, it get, everybody gets it. God Almighty, uh, Psalm 68, 11 and 12 uh, it says, God Almighty declares the word of the gospel with power, and the warring women of Zion deliver its message. The conquering legions have themselves been conquered. Look at them flee. Now Zion's women are left to gather the spoils. When I traveled to Tibet and Bhutan in 2017, Psalm 68, 11, and 12 was our promise verses. God commanded that we go and worship to bless his name in high places where the adversary had set up altars. And in doing so, there would be spoils to share with everyone. So we would go and everyone would, would benefit. So we went, confident in the direct, directive from the Lord. We fulfilled the, mess, the mission. We did what we were supposed to do. But I'm a results kind of gal. I like to look at the data and know that something happened. So I asked the Lord, did it really matter that we are obedient? What could we know about the outcome of our faithfulness? What would God do with it? Right, we do a lot. God asks, does ask us a lot, and sometimes we don't always see the di direct result. But I really wanted, I, I asked God for it because we had traveled a great distance at, at a lot of expense to get there, and we worship. And yes, that's powerful, but I wanted to know what would He do with it. So the last morning, while we're still in Tibet, we gather together as we as we would do every morning in the hotel room to worship God together before going out for the day. That's what we would start with the day. One of the team members, the one from she was from Malaysia, she brought a confirmation. She so she'd woken up in the morning, she got a text from her friends. She's so she was part of the worship and leadership team at the Penang House of Prayer. Uh, while we were in Tibet, the rest of um, her team. So the Penang Hesapra team was in Singapore at a conference where Lou Engel was speaking. And that morning, so as he started the morning session, um, conference session, he had a prophetic word for Tibet. So he quoted Psalm 68, 11 and 12. And then he said, even if just four women go, this word would be accomplished. So someone on her team recorded the word and sent it to her so that she could share it with us. Four women who were in Tibet. And, uh, it, was, uh, it was such a confirmation to my spirit. And it was, God had directly answered me. And yes, it matters. Worship is powerful. It's, it's a weapon that we use to defeat the enemy. In Old Testament battles, the worshipers went first. Why? Like, why? Why would you send unarmed, helpless singers, musicians, and flag bearers. It is a ridiculous strategy. But the battle is won in the worship. And the soldiers are the cleanup crew. They get to take all the spoils. Everyone wins when the battle is won. Everyone in that land has freedom because the battle is won, because the worshipers went out first praising God and worshiping him.
what happens when you stay when you should go? What's the danger? Well, one of the dangers is your loss of cultural influence. When you stay when you should go, you become like the culture around you instead of influencing it. We're, we're called to be influencers. We're, we're called to be ambassadors of the kingdom. God invited the whole camp to meet with him on the mountain, but they were afraid. And so they abdicated their post as royal priests. And instead they stayed behind and made a golden calf to worship. How quickly what seems absurd becomes normal. In Christian news, we heard recently about a Hillsong leader who has given up his faith. He's melting into the culture of apathy and relative truth. Perhaps he was like Aaron, a leader who should have gone up the mountain to meet with God, but instead he submitted to a worldview that doesn't recognize who God truly is. I, I don't know. Like, seriously, I'm 100% speculating. I admit I haven't read any much more than just a few headlines about the news story. I know that it's sad. But a different story, a personal friend who was an amazing worship leader, who's actually one of my, my, when he worshiped, there was something that happened when he worshiped, when he led the church in worship, but he gave it up too. His marriage was struggling. He stopped leading worship. Granted, I understand that. When you're struggling, it's hard to lead others. But eventually he stopped worshiping altogether. So we had maybe a year later, we had a really frank discussion. And if you, I, I'm pretty direct. I know it's a direct question. And we had a really frank discussion and he was honest. He said, he admitted that his value for God was impacted when he stopped worshiping, but at the time he just didn't feel like it anymore. So I'm really sad to say that he's trying to live a life as a rock star now. And he's, there's no evidence of a personal relationship with God in his life. When you stop worshiping, when you stop seeing God as he truly is, not only do you not see God, then you actually have a warped sense of yourself. Then you allow what shouldn't be in your life to start to occupy space in your life. Scripture warns us. It's, he says, then you shall drive out all inhabitants of the land from before you, destroy all their engraved stones, destroy their molded images, and demolish all their high places. If you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your side, and they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. Does anyone have harassments? We have like opposition. We actually have some attacks, truly, but there's lots of things that I know that I've had in my life that I've had to get, that I've allowed there. God is really faithful. Repentance and restoration are his mainstay. So if you go when, you, when God uh, invites you, you have transformation, you're transformed. If you stay when you should go, there's deformation. You, you're become deformed. Neurological science is fascinating to me. I don't study it a lot. I just, out of interest, I like reading it about it or listening to podcasts and stuff. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, I'm not sure if you know who she is. Uh, she's a Christian neuroscientist and psychologist. She teaches about the effects of toxic thinking. She proves with science, this is why I let, she proves with science how our brain patterns change, die, or twist and pervert. Right? Scripture actually gives credence to this. It says, yet they refused to honor him as God or even be thankful for his kindness. Instead, they entertained corrupt and foolish thoughts about what God was like. This left them with nothing but misguided hearts, steeped in moral darkness. And this is why God lifted his restraining hand and let them have the full expression of their sin sinful and shameful desires, all because they traded the truth of God for a lie. Find that in Romans 19. <clears throat> Worshiping God is really, it's good for your brain. It keeps your brain working as it should. What's disconcerting is that your brain doesn't change all at once. It's not just like, unless there's an illness, your brain is, it doesn't have um, instant brain damage. It's gradual and over time. It's toxic thoughts are like cancer cells. The cancer cells erode and pervert good cancer, good cells. So an, until what's left is only toxic, but it doesn't seem toxic anymore because you've learned to live with a diminished brain for so long. You fight back by praising God, by worshiping him. It says, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. And that is the fruit of lips that 
give thanks to him, his name, all the time, continually. Fruit is the result of prolonged action. Praise produces fruit. Keeping silent and not praising God also produces fruit. One is good fruit and the other is rotten and deformed. Something else that happens if you, if you don't go where God asks you to go is you lose territory. Where there's a void in God's presence, another will take its place. It's a scientific law. When people refused God's invitation to go up to the high places and worship him there, the adversary was more than willing to fill those places with altars to worship other gods. You don't have to do anything for evil to flourish. You simply uh, have to do nothing. And the things that are contrary to heavenly kingdom will rush in to assert itself. First Kings 14, 23. For they also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, and wooden images on every high hill and under every tree. And there was also perverted persons in the land. First Kings 2. Meanwhile, people sacrificed at the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. He allowed something to stay. He allowed something to remain. Just like the, the Israelites, if they didn't drive out the, um, all the enemies in the land, they would become a thorn. And it eventually was Solomon's downfall. The other thing that happens if you don't go when God asks you to go is you become barren. There's no fruit. When you stay, you experience barrenness. David brought the Ark of the Lord to Jerusalem. And he worshipped with abandon, right? We know the story. His wife, Michal, Michal was hard-hearted and disdained her husband for his passion. Right? Passion is, is offensive to those who don't have it. Her, her consequence was barrenness. It says, therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So in conclusion, we're going to high worship. What is high worship? What is elevating your praise? I'm going to invite you in a moment to actually elevate your praise literally. We're going to talk about Bhutan, but first I want to close with this story, okay? In 2017, God invited me to go up to the mountain to worship him. It, it really was like a literal invitation, and I felt that there were several reasons why I was invited to be part of a team. First, it would bless God. Worship proceeds every move of God, and he was about to move. That was point number two. He was going to move. Worship invites the glory of God to fill the place, and currently the enemy had strongholds where we were going. The law of displacement, the scientific law, states that when something with more substance fills a place, that what is already there is squeezed out, right? Light overcomes darkness. The glory of God is greater than any tarnished glory of the enemy. So I also knew that I could not participate in a call so great. I, I understand, like this, the call was in, incredible to be able to go to the mountain and worship the Lord, minister to him there was, I didn't take that lightly. I looked at my life and I asked God to help me tear down the, uh, the altars of idol worship in the metaphorical high places so that every area of my life was free to worship God. That I would stake a, a flag, I would, I would stake a flag in every area, that every high place that was not submitted to God. So my church family, the, the, the church that I was going to at the time, um, they caught the vision and they were, they willingly participated in this call. So not only just in the sending um, and supporting uh, me with prayer, I was going to go to the high places, but there was a demand on everyone to worship high places in their life and in the life of the church. So I planned, uh, we planned, we called them high worship nights, three nights, uh, different times over, the, over a few months uh, of just kind of freestyle worship. Anything, anything goes. We would we started at seven and, and we would go till the wee hours of the morning. Uh, there was flags, there was art, there was like kind of every form of creative expression. Uh, and we prayed, we worshiped, we prophesied, we confessed. And then while I was away, well, so that was three nights leading up to the trip. While I was away in Tibet, 
um, and where I was going to be worshiping my church family back home would be joining me uh, to worship for the fourth and final high worship event. It was uh, it was amazing. Those nights, the worship night, high, high worship nights, were God's presence was so tangible. It was thick. It was beautiful. It was. I felt I felt transparent before the Lord. I mean, it definitely changed me. It did prepare me. Other church members said the same thing. We asked God to remove any altar in a high place in our life and set up an altar for worshiping him instead. Okay, so I've already shared a little bit about that trip and how God confirmed his word to us, but he also confirmed his word through answered prayer to remove the high places in our own lives. So I'd been doing this series of whatever the Lord would bring to me, I would smash that high place and so that I would be prepared. On the day that I returned, the associate pastor, the one that I had planned these nights with, he and his wife were charged with 28 counts of sexual abuse that spanned four years and five girls. The aftermath is painful. When we ask God to smash those altars and we're serious about it, he does. Just like literally climbing a mountain is strenuous and takes endurance and effort, the willingness to get to the high places in your life that need to be smashed, it's painful and arduous, but it's necessary. It, it's been really messy. We're still in the midst of it, the church. I mean, the church is scattered, but it's still in the midst of it. But we asked for it. I remember thinking, we asked for this. This was so painful. Why, 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 why? But we asked for it. We asked for those high places to be smashed. If you want to elevate your praise, you have to get rid of the things that are already there. If God is asking you to go to the top, he wants to do it with you. He wants you to stake a flag and claim that place and worship the Lord. So may, I pray that may all of the high places in your life be dedicated to the Lord. May you have trans, be transformed in the journey and expand your territory and have victory in the Lord. I am going to pray for you, and then I'm going to stop this recording. Um, then we're going to restart the, the recording for a clean video. We're going to talk about the Bhutan ministry trip. There's an invitation for you to elevate your praise and go to the mountains. And I'll tell you about that. So if you, at that point, if you, if you want to leave, I need to go. I know we're, we're coming up onto the hour. Uh, and if you have any questions, concerns, we can actually talk about that in a, in a moment. But let's, let me pray. Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you for that you were with us, even in the pain of smashing those idols, that we would be willing, willing, and that we would be brave enough to go up the mountain with you, that we would see what's there, that we would take stock and that we would get rid of anything and everything that is not in our life that shouldn't be there and that we would worship you there, that we will respond, that we say yes, that the fire catchers say yes, that we would be influencers of, of where you've placed us, everywhere that you've placed us, that everywhere our foot, feet go, that you're that we worship you along the way that we're transformed and that we're transforming our culture. That when we worship you, you set the ambush and that everybody gets the spoils. Everybody gets the benefits of the kingdom when we bring that in. I pray this morning. Thank you for the time that people have, have given me, have listened to me. Um, I pray that, that your words, your truth just does remain and that there would be a response and that you would willingly take the response as a sacrifice, as a place to, to start fresh, to, to build up worship, that there would be, that you would exercise, um, that we would be strong in our spirit to be able to worship wherever you ask us to go. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I'm going to stop this.